rituals um, that when I served in Jacksonville, I had the privilege of occasionally visiting our youth at the various schools throughout the city, including Stanton Preparatory High School, which is a fabulous magnet school in Jacksonville where James Weldon Johnson served briefly. It was um, too brief, I think, for his students and fellow teachers as the principal of Stanton Preparatory School before he went off and became a diplomat for um, President Roosevelt. So um, Kathy's going to tell you more about James Weldon Johnson and lift every voice and sing. Um, but uh, once again, Kathy, uh, we're going to virtually clap for you and just welcome you back home on Zoom to St. John's. <laughs> um, it's a tremendous blessing to have you with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to you so that we can learn more about this, this, great, this great spiritual. Thank you so much. It is such an honor from, to have been invited. So I want to thank First Mother Abby and of course Father Dave for this wonderful invitation to be here today. Um, I have been um, probably pacing up and down here in the house all morning long, waiting for this coffee hour to begin and waiting for an opportunity to say hello to all of you. And it is just it, really, really exciting. So thank you very much for this invitation. Um, let's get started first with a prayer and then I'll tell you a little bit about what's been going on here in uh, North Carolina and all that good stuff. Oh, I guess I should share my screen. That'll be helpful. There we go. Let us pray. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you who have brought us thus far on the way with Christ, the one in whom is our true and perfect freedom. Give us grace to honor the lives of your precious children, enslaved in body yet free in mind. May we forever stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before and make no peace with oppression. That children of slaves and former slave owners may one day live in harmony through Jesus Christ, our liberator, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So I know that 2020 has been quite the year for us all, um, for it is a year in which we find ourselves battling really two pandemics, COVID-19, which like Florida, North Carolina's numbers are going in the wrong direction. They're continuing to elevate, Hospitalizations are up again today, and so this is not good news. Um, the dates for reopening our churches continues to be pushed back, and there is no new date set at this time. And so we all find ourselves in that waiting period for things to get better and for things to change, and that hopefully a time when we will have in gatherings again. But in the meantime, we also find ourselves in this moment battling another pandemic, which of course is the continuation of overt racism in our land. Now, May 25th <laughs> is really considered an inflection point in this nation. And protests and social unrest has been going on since that date. For as the country watched for eight minutes and 46 seconds, the literal sniffing out of a life, the ending of, one, of a human a human being's life. It is a moment in which the co collectively the nation got to cry and we heard the nation's cries for something different and for a better way and a different way. Of course, we also know that this is not the first inflection point that we've had in America. We had the Civil War and we had a moment in which the country had to decide was it going to continue to be the United States of America or was it going to go into different forms of a country, different countries where everybody could do something different? And slavery, of course, was the inflection point at which we had to decide, were we willing to let go of that so that we could continue to be a united country? And in the end, slavery was eliminated. And yet at the same time, we know that that gave rise in the South to the Jim Crow South, to the Jim Crow laws. And so 
That continued for quite a while, for another hundred years. And then in the 1960s, we hit another inflection point, and that was the civil rights movement. And it was a day in which, in March, when people saw people getting trampled by horses and people getting beaten by nightsticks by police officers, that the country paused again and said, is this who we want to be? Is this how we want to be defined as America? Do we want to be known as a country that treats others this badly? And collectively, again, the cries of the people went up and the decision was made that maybe not. And so we saw that give rise to the civil rights legislation after many demonstrations and all of that. So we have had these inflection period, inflection moments. The question for us now though, is that there's something different this time. There seems to be something that was drastically different in these eight minutes and 46 seconds, which we witnessed as a country, the murder of George Floyd. But I wanna to suggest to you this morning that as that gave rise to the idea of the we can't breathe movement, the hearing this man crying out for all of those moments saying we can't breathe, that in that span of time, um, while many white Americans were really shocked and really, um, you know, just overwhelmed with a sense of grief at this notion of we can't breathe, that for your black brothers and sisters, we have been saying this for many generations now. There has been this sense in our communities of we can't breathe. Our ancestors said they couldn't breathe because fear kept them from being able to breathe, that if they said too much, they could be beaten, they could be sold away from their families. And then we saw another generation of Black people who said, we can't breathe, for fear that if they did the wrong thing or they said the wrong thing, they would be lynched. And we see those, some of those historical accounts now in Montgomery of what has happened. And, and of course, with the lynching um, project that you're doing there in Tallahassee. So we've had moments. For Black people, we can't breathe is something that is thought of every time our children leave home in cars, going off to social activities, and that hope and that prayer that they're going to get back safe and sound, and that they're not going to have an encounter with police or with someone who would do them harm, or they're going to be hurt because their music is too loud, or their hair is too long, or something that judges them, and in an instant, their lives can be taken from them. So the question now is, as a nation, how do we get to a place where we can all breathe again? And if you think about it, in the, in the month of June, May, in May in particular, you think about Ahmaud Arbery and followed immediately by Breonna Taylor and then followed by George Floyd was maybe just too much for us to see and to bear. So, a lot of people have been calling and wondering what kind of action can they take? What can they do now? How do they speak out in this moment? How do they show solidarity with their other brothers and sisters? And that's an interesting question. And I hope that I know that um, there at St. John's, you all are continuing to pray about that. And I think that is the right order. Um, I encourage you, as you will see at the end, is that I think in logical order, you have to pray about it and then you have to listen to the stories, listen to the pain and the sufferings of others and let that dwell in you into a point in which you have compassion for what has happened, for what is happening, and then let that guide the actions that you feel that you should take. So I'm gonna start because you know I like to tell stories. So I will tell you that in these times, in these last few weeks, it has been um, overwhelming at times. It has been joyous at other times because we do serve a God, like Father Dave said this morning, that gives us great joy. And um, so I have been um, really excited by the um, 
occasions in which I have been asked to speak to people and to have dialogue and people wanting to engage in conversation because I find that a very positive move and that's a move and that's a way in which I can lift my voice. Um, everybody cannot do street protests. Uh, I tell people I can't run so I can't run from I can't outrun tear gas. I can't sit on the ground so I'm not going to be out of the street and I don't feel bad about that. I just know that there are so many ways in which we can use our voice and we can do our part. Conversely, um, my 21-year-old nephew, Andrew, who you all have heard me talk about sometimes, was with me here from the end of March when UNC, uh, UNC um, Charlotte closed until um, a couple of weeks ago. So he came to me, um, I think it was the, the Sunday before Father's Day, and he said, um, Aunt Kathy, I want to go downtown this afternoon and participate in the protest. Well, <laughs> I cannot tell you the fear and the trepidation that filled my heart and my soul at that moment. Um, we're in a city where we don't know anyone but each other. And, um, I, and I know that some of these demonstrations have been very, very peaceful and others have gone sideways and have led to all kinds of commotion and you know, upheaval. And they were taking down statues and I just did not know um, what could happen. And he was going to have to go alone. And um, I really had to pray about that. But in the end, what I realized was that he was 21 years old. He was a young adult and he wanted to um, use his voice. He wanted to lift his voice. And the way that he saw fit to do that really was to do the protests. So um, after careful prayer between the two of us, um, he designed his sign, we demand justice. We got in the car, we drove downtown to uh, downtown Raleigh and um, he protested and I went back and I picked him up and I prayed for no COVID and, and that he would be safe from all of that. Um, and he's quite fine. And, um, and I think it was a good moment for him because it allowed him to express the, ver the feelings that he had been having all of these weeks in terms of watching this from a distance. So everybody gets to use their voices in the way that they deem most appropriate and in the ways that they need to. And we have to give everyone space to do that in their own manner. But for some of others, um, some of the congregations that I've attended, where we have some of our older Black folks, um, some of the feeling from them has been that they are so tired, that they're really exhausted of having to do this again and again and again. And so then I thought about the question. Um, I remember Christine Cleveland, a professor, a former professor at Duke University, had this wonderful question about where do you go and what do you do when the world hurts too much? And I think that that really lends itself at this moment because the question I think that some in some black communities are asking right now is how do you use your voice when you cannot breathe? When the exhaustion of it all, and I thought about a baby, if you've ever seen babies when they get so tired and they've been crying for so long because they can't have their way and there are no more tears and there's no more sound coming out, but they're still, their mouths are going and they're heaving up and down until finally they just knock themselves out. And it's kind of like that kind of sense of feeling, I think, that what do you do when you just can't breathe anymore? And I think with that, we say to our, we say, I would say, then we get help from others. And this is a moment in which everybody coming together to help one another can really change the world and can really change things. So today I thought we would, as a part of listening and thinking about um, action steps, I wanted, I thought um, the hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, is a wonderful illustration of how Black people have suffered and endured tremendous pain, and yet have never lost their faith in a God who continues to walk with us on this journey, and that we can all look forward to a better day. Um, and this hymn is really a poem that was set to music. Um, 
It's a beautiful poem by the brothers James Weldon and Rosamond Johnson. And as Father Dave mentioned, native um, Jacksonville folks, native Floridians, born and raised in Jacksonville. And um, James Weldon Johnson is the author. Rosamond was actually the composer. They did other musicals that were on Broadway and in New York and the Harlem Renaissance. And they were social activists because James Weldon Johnson, of course, went on to become a big major attorney in the NAACP. So just a few other details about them. They were born in Florida. Their mother was a proud Anglican woman from Nassau, the Bahamas, and I can relate to that because that's where my grandmother was from. And their father was born a freeman in Virginia. Uh, the family joined the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church in Florida after, she would, after a visit to New York City, and they were attending St. John's. And according to James Weldon Johnson, she had a beautiful soprano voice. And she sang very loud because she loved her music. And at the end of the service, the vicar went to her and told her that she was no longer welcome there because she sang too loud. And so with that, she vowed never to go to an Episcopal church again, but we still have Episcopal in it. CME is the church that they joined back in uh, Jacksonville. So when he wrote the song for um, Lift Every Voice and Sing, it was written as a celebratory um, song to, uh, for the anniversary of the birth of Abraham Lincoln. And there were 500 children who, were, who sang this song in this celebration in the school in Jacksonville in 1900. And that song became very popular very quickly. It was sung so many times in black communities that it became known as the Negro National Anthem and of course today the Black National Anthem. And its popularity really came as a total surprise to the Johnson brothers. And in fact, um, there is in his uh, autobiography, James Weldon Johnson mentions that Southern white churches, a lot of them used to write to him and tell him that they too sang the song. And I always marveled at that because I always wondered if people really listened to the words and really knew what the song was. It has such a festive beat to it that I'm never sure if people like the words or they like the music. And so that was one of the reasons that I chose this for today. Um, I will tell you another quick story and then we'll dive into the stanzas of the poem. I went to the um, Cathedral Church of St. Luke in Orlando, probably about a dozen years ago. And if you walk into their church in the nave, they have all these flags flying. They have the state flag, the country's flag, the, um, the church's flag. And um, we were a little late. I think we got there a little about five minutes after. So they had the first reading. So they had everybody just wait in the nave until they uh, started to sing. And um, we noticed that they had the Confederate flag flying. And I was like, wow, a Confederate flag inside a church. I'd never seen that before. And um, took me back and, and um, but we said, you know, we're here already, so we will stay for the service. And um, indeed we did. And, um, at the, and so we finally went into the nave and we sat next to this lovely couple. They were like five of us together. And so at the end for the processional hymn, it was lift every voice and sing. And they were happy, happy to sing this hymn. But I'm looking around and I'm thinking about the contradiction of these two things, right? That you have the Confederate flag flying over lift every voice and sing. And how do you exactly make sense of that? And so from then, I think I've always pondered as to what did people hear in the words of this song? And so today I just want to, I think we can just go through it. And hear and, and listen to the words and then and then I'll just give a few thoughts about, about the poem itself. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on 
till victory is won. So you can hear a lot just in that first stanza. I think the first part of this is really this idea of optimism. I hear optimism in this about the pra and praise and freedom. So imagine that this is written in 1900, about 30 years past um, the Civil War. And so this is a moment in which though, we're still praising God in this moment. And so he is calling out to everyone to lift their voices and to sing because we're giving rise to a new world, a new time, a new place. And so it rings with the harmonies of liberty, a time when we're going to be free as people of color. And what does that mean for us? And so that it's going to be in harmony with heaven and earth. And so God is going to love this new world that we've created. And so we are praising God lustily in this moment, resound loud as the rolling seas. Um, always remembering though, he's reminding us even in this moment that we're to remember the, the faith that has gotten us to where we, are at, where we are at this point. The faith that the dark past has taught us and sing a song though always full of hope hope that the present has brought us so it is this idea though that our work is not done so that even though we're looking at this new day in which we seem to have more freedom we have to keep marching and so i think it me it makes as much sense today as it did in 1900 for today we find ourselves still marching right we're still waiting for victory to be won and we're still hopeful because we are people of faith, and that is what God calls us to do. If we move on then to the second stanza, let us hear these words. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Again, we have this inflection point. We have this moment in which we're looking backwards and we're thinking about the road that we've been on and we're also, and how bitter that road was. And so let me insert a story here for you. And I think Father Dave has heard this story. I think I told this story once before. Um, so my, um, old, my uncle, my father's oldest brother, decided to go to church with his wife one Sunday. Um, they were in their 80s, and um, they were living in Apple Valley, California. And so she was a very devout member of the Church of Christ out there, and he would go ever so often. But this particular morning, she kept inciting him to go with her. So finally, he's like, okay, fine, I'll go. And um, off they went. And so in the Church of Christ, um, there's a part of the service where people can come up and give testimonies. And so um, this gentleman stood up and said he would like to give a testimony that morning. And uh, the pastor invited him to come forward. He was an elderly white man and he started talking and he said that, um, you know, he was wet, getting up in age and he didn't know how much time he had left. And he just really had something on his heart that he wanted to talk about and he wanted to ask for forgiveness for. And the pastor told him to continue. And so he was talking about having uh, been a bus driver, a school bus driver in rural Alabama in the late 20s and early 30s. And um, of course, schools were segregated in rural Alabama. And so um, he said that um, every morning he would pass these two little black boys on the road. And some days it was raining. And he felt so bad because he couldn't pick them up. 
Some days it was snowing and whatever the weather was, sometimes it was really hot, but he would always pass these boys and it seemed like no matter what, they would always, they would always get to school. And he said, I never knew what happened to them, but I always felt bad. I felt bad for many, many years that I never stopped and picked them up. And, um, but now, you know, I would just like to be forgiven for that, for the choice that I made. But that was the time that we were living in. But I would give anything to know what happened to those boys. And at that moment, my uncle stood up and he said to the man, well, I want you to know that those boys turned out just fine because I'm one of them and my brother Kenneth is the other. Now, Kenneth was my father. And so in this unbelievable small world, large world, these two people connected in this church in Alabama, from Alabama in Al Apple Valley, California. So they could both feel this, the road that they had all trod, right? The stony road that they'd all been on and how bitter it was and felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Recently, the police, the police chief in Minneapolis after George Floyd's dying talked about a deficit of hope. And so you have these two congruent things, I think. A deficit of hope and places and spaces in our nation where hope has never been born. Where people feel like, young people who feel like they're never going to live past the age of young adulthood. Places of unborn hope where people don't have any hope for a future that includes any type of prosperity or equality. And that's a difficult, place to be in. But yet we turn back to God again. So we invite people always to come back to the place of where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. And that's always cast on Jesus. That's always cast on a God who is going to be on this journey with us. And that hopefully will help lead all of us to this white, to the bright star, to the light, um, to a better day. And so we do come over a place that with tears has been watered. And yet we use those tears to empower us for better times and use those tears to, to show people <clears throat> the pain that you can endure and that you can still continue, keep moving. Um, so this one is really more, this stanza is really that pause moment where we remember where we have been where we have come from. And then finally, that will take us to stanza number three. And this is how it goes. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, Keep us forever in the path, we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. God of our weary years, so we, again, we know that God has been with us through this entire amount. And I think about this, you think about Exodus, you think about the people in the wilderness, that no matter how long they were on the journey, no matter how many times they got tired, no matter how many times they wailed at God, that he wasn't doing enough for them, God never abandoned them. And so I think that this stanza really speaks to that. And it speaks also to the human condition that, we don't do these things on our own. We cannot get through this life by ourselves. And so we remind ourselves that even in our jubilance of small steps, of good things that have happened, of when we've made progress, that we're never to forget how and who gave us, who helped us with that progress. That we always remember that we're thanking God in all of those moments. And so like you see in the Psalms where you see, 
even we thank God for the good times and we thank God for being with us in the bad times. And so I think that, you know, so that we don't get drunk with the wine of the world and begin to believe in ourselves to the extent that we believe that we did it on our own. You know, that, uh, that crazy thing about pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. Uh, but they're really, you know, we're holding on always to God's hand and God is the one who is, is leading us through this. And, um, and so that moment, though, that we're going to forever stand true to our God and true to our native land, which in this moment, we're, we're talking about America. And so what does that look like um, for us as a people? So as a group, as a, as a culture of people, I think African Americans, of course, have a unique story here in the United States in terms of slavery, un unlike uh, some of our other brothers and sisters of the African diaspora. And yet in this moment, I think we all find ourselves joined together, knit together, so that we can figure out how we get to a place where, like Martin Luther King Jr., if you think about it, said in 1965, that one day my children are going to be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And that seems to be a place that we're still working towards. We're still trying to get there. And so this seems to be a moment in which we could hope to achieve that. We could get there. And then we could look to what are the next, where's the next place that we have to get to? And what's the next place and the next place? Um, so I think in terms of the tears and the idea though that God will wipe away the tears, um, we think about revelation and you know, we hear this, this reading a lot during funerals. Uh, we use this passage a lot in our funerals but it's true as much today. Um, so let's just uh, read this. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I think that this can also be used to illustrate that we don't have to wait until death for God to wipe away the tears from our eyes, or that he will, and the water of life does not have to be an afterlife necessarily, but that we could achieve, and we could find the springs of the water of life here on earth, depending upon the actions that we all take and how we move together in solidarity to make the changes that I think we're all looking for at this moment. So that's just going to, that depends on us, our relationship with God. And after we pray about what we should do as next steps, then we can begin to think about how we move closer to the world that God always visioned for his people, all of his people. And in that manner, I think that we will be living a life that is pleasing, truly pleasing to the God that we all serve. So in terms of um, next steps, I would say that we have to pray, we have to listen to one another, and then we act. And then we will all lift our voices, however you wanna lift your voice. Write letters if you can't be in the protest. <laughs> Write letters and for, all, for God's sake, please go and vote. However you want to, I don't get into that, but vote, vote your conscience. And do remember that black lives matter. That takes nothing away from everybody else. That just says with intention that we want to acknowledge that black lives truly matter. And that when we believe that, and when we have that compassion for that thought, um, it will help again, guide the actions that we will take. And it will all lead us into a better place. So, how are we going to respond in such a time as this? So I'll hearken you back and end with Esther because <laughs> Mordecai told her, for if you keep your silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. And that is my prayer for us all today.
that we're all here for such a time as this. And now I invite us to have conversation. We have a few minutes left. And I'll open it up to Mother Abby and Father Dave to do whatever they like. <laughs> Friends, we want to encourage you to submit questions either um, by using the chat screen, questions, observations, you can use the chat screen as well as uh, just taking yourself off of mute. Uh, but this is an opportunity for us to have dialogue with Reverend Kathy, with each other. Um, so I encourage your questions and thoughts at this time. Uh, Reverend Kathy, uh, this is Nancy, and it's so nice to see you. Um, we miss you. Uh, I just thought your program was so beautiful. It just touched my heart, and uh, everything you use, every used everything that you wove into this, like um, the story of, um, I, I, I guess it was your nephew, uh, who wanted to protest, and the wonderful story of your uncle um, standing up in church, um, responding to the forgiveness of, of the white man. And, and I will uh, look up the words to lift every voice um, and sing. Um, it'll be online and I'll copy it. And that's absolutely beautiful. And such a beautiful testimony to the struggle of um, certainly black people and, and many other people. Uh, just so beautiful. So thank you for putting together this little homecoming for us. And it's just so wonderful to see you. You were so kind to me. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. It's such a joy to be here this morning. I'm glad to see you and see that you're doing well. Yeah, I can walk. <laughs> <laughs> That's a blessing. That is a blessing. Thank you. And mm -hmm. um, I, I signed in a little bit late. Did, uh, did you tell us how you're doing initially that I missed? Well, actually not too much. Um, I, will add, I will say to you that, um, you know, it's a funny time to move to a new city. Yes. <laughs> 2020 has, it was a strange time to move. And um, so I was here, um, I think, five weeks um, before um, the bishop said to us in a staff meeting one Thursday, I think it's going to be prudent for us to close our office for exactly two weeks. He said, because, you know, that's about the incubation period for this virus. So I think um, you all should take home, you know, a few files so that we can continue working from home. I don't know exactly how we're going to do that. And I was excited because in that five week span of time, I had finally figured out how to get from my office to my house without my GPS. And I was feeling pretty good. <laughs> and that was about as far as I could get. <laughs> and I found Publix. I was excited because there is a Publix in Raleigh. And that kind of just, it, it grounded me and I had a feeling of home because I was feeling kind of discombobulated. Um, and so now I've been home for four months. And, um, it, you know, this is my normal. I tell people this is not my new normal, Zooming. This has been really the norm for me. Uh, since my arrival here, and um, so I'm learning. I made them learn to make the most of it, and it is. Um, it's and now and you know eventually you have to get on with the work to be done, and so it's it's good times. It's exciting, and uh, and one day I'll get to know Raleigh when it opens up again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Reverend Kathy. I have a question. Number hello. One. Hello. So good to see you. Um, I teach at TCC, American History, mm -hmm. and I've just found out I'm going to start the second half of the survey course, which starts with Reconstruction, and it'll go through Jim Crow. And, you know, in class, when I teach, it's a lecture class, we have some questions, but nothing really deep. And I see a lot of African-American faces looking at me, and I think, what are you thinking? And so this semester, it'll be online, and I would like to facilitate a dialogue between my students what, and this may help everybody, what sort of questions should you ask African-American students, people in general, that will start a dialogue that could be productive? Well, 
I think one of the things you can always start and you know, with younger people, it's going to be slightly different. I think you can ask, I think for young people right now, you could ask them what their experience has been, um, what their experience is in the United States of America right now, and then begin to help them trace that back a little bit. Um, so what have they heard about their ancestors? Because remember, for many of them, for many of us, we really can't trace our ancestry back too far anyway. But they may know of, they may be able to go back as far as slavery. I do know that my great grandmother was a slave um, on my father's side and um or great grandparents and that's not really far but of course i'm a little older than your college students but i think just getting them to open up a little bit at first about their own history and what they know about that and then helping them to link to the past and what they've been told about that and um you know I, i'll tell you some anecdotes it's, it's strange little things that they may know for instance when we used to travel from miami to alabama in the summer one of the things that people used to say which I think was designed to scare us, was that the Spanish moths that you saw hanging on the trees were, Ill, were, um, were the vestiges of people having been lynched. So as a kid, Spanish moths terrified me um, because I always envisioned that that was somebody, somebody who had been lynched on a tree. I see some people shaking their heads that yes, they had heard that. So just starting with stories like that, um, can open up a wealth of conversation. Thank you. You're welcome. Kathy, there's a question down in the chat from Dennis about how St. John's might be more intentional about listening to our Black brothers and sisters in Tallahassee. Where do we start reaching out? Hmm. Well, I am thinking that there are all kinds of organizations in Tallahassee um, where you can have those conversations. And, um, and there's such a wealth of information there. I mean, I think just starting somewhere, you know, with FAMU, not in terms of lecture series, but just again, having um, conversation around telling the history. Because I think in some of these communities, we're gonna have to go back and we're gonna have to reopen the history books and we're gonna have to insert some stories, some of the real stories of what happened, um, you know, and, um, and I, Tallahassee is rich with stories, of course, um, from slavery through um, Jim Crow, of course. My mother graduated from FAMU in the 50s, so I know that there are a lot, a lot of stories in, um, in Tallahassee. And so I just really feel that um, starting probably just with the wealth of people that you have at FAMU, but you also have people who can tell anecdotal stories there reach out, I'm, I'm looking at Marcy Sanders and I know that she's big in sorority life there. And you know, if you think about the sororities and fraternities there, they have a long history in Tallahassee. Um, I mean, they go back generations and I'm sure that they have many, many stories. And I think listening to those kind of stories that um, from the people from there and about there um, can really be very, very helpful. and can also help to, to identify what it is you want to do now and what are you going to do with that information and i think always that has to be um the part of the thought process i have this information now what am i going to do with it reverend kathy uh thank you for that and when you talked about giving a fuller sense of history it made me think of a project that st john's has been involved with for a few years and i see that sandra howard is on this uh, call. I'm wondering, Sandra, could you uh, give everyone in the forum um, just a little background on the Community Remembrance Project and also the big news that took place this week? And I saw that. Thank you, Father Dave. Hi, Kathy. Hello, Sandra. So good to see you. Um, well, the Community Remembrance Project um, began about two and a half years ago. It was an effort that was started by three churches in Tallahassee. Um, St. Michael and All Angels, First Presbyterian, and St. John's. And it has grown to consist of 33 community partners now. Um, and we have been trying to um, make sure that there is a proper remembrance of the four victims of lynching that we know that are documented. We know there are probably many more in Leon mm -hmm. County. And just 
this week, um, the city commission uh, approved our request to erect a narrative marker at the intersection of South Meridian and um, East Gaines Street. And so there will be a marker there permanently to remember those four victims. Sandra, could, could you also say a word about the connections with the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, as well as the educational aspects of the markers, that it, it goes beyond just the markers, but also curriculum materials for children and youth? Absolutely. Well, the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery is our, our big partner. They have been shepherding this for us all along the way. And they encouraged us to do certain things, to be very thoughtful, to bring in all of these partners, to not, to not just hurry ahead and get it done, but to have conversations. So um, they, they have been a partner. They were here uh, several times. They visited twice for meetings with us, their representatives, and we are so grateful for that. Um, they helped us put together a soil collection project, and now they are helping us have the marker made. They actually take care of ordering and paying for the marker. Um, and Dave, you're absolutely right. This is, the marker is just one really small piece in a way of this project because our goal is to have lots of educational activities around this discussion of this horrible period in our history, but also to lead us beyond that into really listening as Kathy was saying to what others are saying and how we as a community can work uh, to have true uh, racial justice in our community. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that update. And Father you know, Gaines, I'm sorry. Uh, just if, if this Pam Anderson, um, just real quickly, if we also might mention um, the background on the Equal Justice Initiative is um, Brian Stevenson, if I'm remembering correctly, excuse the dog barking, um, which if people haven't seen the movie Just Mercy, um, I would highly recommend it. Thank you, Pam, thank you for that. Uh, Brian Stevenson, of course, is a uh, attorney who has worked to free uh, wrongly charged um, men and African-American men and women um, and to get them free from uh, prison where they have been imprisoned unjustly. And he also, along with the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, uh, were very active in getting the new museum for, um, I think it's called Peace and Justice, or you know, uh, I'm probably a little bit off there. Um, and there is uh, a museum as well as a memorial to victims of lynching there um, that many of you are aware of, many of you have visited there. St. John's has taken a couple of pilgrimages uh, to Montgomery, including with our young people that Reverend Kathy was uh, a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the important things that that museum does is help us all see the connections between slavery, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration in our own time and place. And that's why it is so important for us to do this historical work so that we can have a greater consciousness of injustice in our present. Um, other questions and, and observations for Reverend Kathy or for the group? Mother Kathy, I just wanna say, um, it, I am so happy to see you again and I miss you a lot. And uh, I hope you do other Zoom meetings with our church because it's just so nice to see you again. Oh, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I do see a question here. Charles's iPhone. Is it, oh, this is Father Wallace. Hello. Yeah, it's Wallace. His first name is Charles. <laughs> hey, Kathy. Hello there. I see your question here. So let me, let me see. Do you think social isolation has helped or hurt as our nation deals with what happened this spring? A part of me feels like we need to be together to discuss. However, I wonder if you feel like this has been a holy pause to reflect, what is your feeling? So it's been a, it's been a, a joy and a challenge. I think that the um, short answer on that is that if we had not been in a place of pause when the George Floyd murder happened, we might have had a different response to it 
because it would have been a part of the normal activities of our life. And it's like, oh, another news story. But I think that the fact that we have been at home for so long and we've tried to focus on different things beyond working from home and being stuck at home, but it's forced us to really look at a lot of, of, of uh, different things. And I think it was so egregious that it was in a moment where we were already in that pause phase and it caused us to just pause even more um, and then react. So I think that it's harder, of course, to, I think to have these conversations over Zoom land, but I think it's possible. It, cre it charges our creativity to figure out how to continue to do this work um, because I don't think it's a moment in which we can stop altogether. And, you know, using the idea that, um, um, well, since we can't be together in person, we should probably save this for another time. And I think that the country is, is aiming and is pleading and crying out this moment to do the work anyway. Um, but I do think that it gives us, it does give us moments though, in which we can still be quiet in our quiet places and really reflect on where it is we're going and how we're going to get there. And so in that time, when we do come back together in person, we're going to be brimming with ideas, with ideas, but it will be based on some reflection and we also have time to study and to do our work. Reverend Kathy, one of the connections that we made as a congregation uh, right around the time of Pentecost was um, that you have a disease that robs people of breath and you have the murder of George Floyd who called out for breath. Mm -hmm. And it, it strikes me that, um, you know, what you spoke of today is that it's in times like these where we do have to um, open ourselves completely to be resuscitated by our living God who fills us with the breath of God and who can blow over all of our dried and bleached bones that just at the moment where we feel like there is very little hope, that it is God who can resuscitate us and give us that, that breath. Um, other, we have a few minutes, maybe a time for one or two more questions. Father Dave, this is Marcy. Um, I just want to give a shameless plug for an organization that actually Reverend Kathy founded which is the Union of Black Episcopalians. We do have a chapter here, the David Henry um, Brooks chapter. Uh, and again, uh, Reverend Kathy is a, is a founder of that chapter, but if you have not heard of the Union of Black Episcopalians, I'll drop the link here. Um, it's an opportunity in response to Dennis's question of how we get involved and how we do things that, that can advance our, um, our chances to engage and be better. Um, you don't have to be black to be a member. <laughs> you know, we want come one, come all, you just have to be about um, advancing the cause of, of people, people of color, and, and especially in the church, in the Episcopal church. And as we look to grow our church, it's an excellent opportunity to encourage people of, of color and who are hungry. People are hungry for something right now. They're looking to, even in this time of Zoom and, and church online, people are still hungry and they're hungry for God and, and how to engage people and bring people into our church because we do meet you where you are and we do love you from wherever you come from. And so um, I would love to have you join us um, in UBE and uh, Reverend Kathy can tell you more about that it, as it is part of her, her uh, mission. <laughs> well, yeah, well, the Union of Black Episcopalians is actually an organization that's been around about 50, 51 years. And we were scheduled to gather in two weeks time in Montgomery this year um, to, to go and see um, the, um, the uh, places that Father Dave was referencing earlier the Equal Justice Institute, of course, the Rosa Parks Museum and all those good things in Montgomery. Um, but that was not to be this year. And so we're hopeful that um, we will get to do that in 2021. But it is an organization that has been around to really support the um, 
the, the black Episcopalians. One of the things that was really humorous to me when I, um, when I first went to seminary, when I went to Virginia Theological Seminary, and the, uh, some, many of the students um, there in my class really had come, came from communities where it was a pr where their communities were predominantly white. And so black Episcopalians seemed kind of like an enigma to them, which was very strange to me because in Miami, we had sort of the opposite. I mean, we, uh, our churches were black. We thought all uh, Episcopalians were black for a while, but we knew the history. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, we, but we certainly know that there are a lot of black Episcopalians who have been striving for years from the time of when you had archdeacons who were, specifically assigned to do what they called colored work. Um, they could not be full bishops in the, in the Episcopal church and all of that. So the linkage and the lineage goes back long and, and, and very long. And so um, the UBE really exists to support Black Episcopalians to tell the stories, to also ensure that they have equal opportunities to all of the various committees and um, uh, that make up the, the tentacles of the Episcopal Church. It's a huge operation, and we want to be sure that all voices are heard there. And, um, you know, uh, people said, well, we've arrived, we have a Black bishop, look at that, presiding bishop, but we know that there's still a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work to be done. And so through organizations like the Union of Black Episcopalians, we continue to do that work and to tell our story. Reverend Kathy, we are so grateful for you making the time to teach and inspire us this morning. And quite frankly, it's just great to see you and hear and just reconnect with you. <laughs> um, I think one of the things we could do, and this is kind of the, my takeaway, it's so powerful, the lift every voice and sing hymn, is that we at St. John's can continue to commit ourselves to trying to do whatever we can to make a difference, to lift up every voice. I mean, that to me is a powerful image that every voice counts, every voice has authority. We're all part of the royal priesthood of God. Um, and I, I am just grateful to you, Kathy, for inspiring us to do that work. As stony as the road may sometimes be, we're all on this road together. Um, I want you to know how much we love you and appreciate you and um, we'll hold you in prayer as you uh, lead in North Carolina now. And I'm wondering if you would close us today uh, with your blessing and a prayer. Yes, I sure will. And before I do that, I just wanna to say to all of you online today and those who could not be with us, that I thank you so much for, for inviting me. I, you know, it's funny, when you leave a church, a lot of times people say, well, you know, you really shouldn't contact the people. You've got to have that time apart. And I was like, oh my God. And when the pandemic hit, I wanted to call everybody because I was like, I need, I need company. I need somebody to talk to. <laughs> um, so I am so glad that we have this ongoing relationship. I just want you to know that I love you all. And and I really do carry you in my heart and I pray for you every day as a congregation and individually as well. So please stay safe in the midst of these COVIDs. We can overcome this and, and be well. And then with that, the Lord be with you and also oh, with Lord you. Be. Let us pray. God of all life, you call us to live in community and to teach us to care for one another after the pattern of Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. We pray for those whose position and authority affect the lives of others. Inspire them with a vision of the community as it might be, where love of neighbor and concern for one another drive out discontent and strife, anxiety and fear. Help us all to work together with one heart and will, with sympathy and understanding to serve the common good to minister to people in trouble and despair, and to multiply, multiply true happiness among us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Nice Amen. to see you, Reverend Kathy. Love you all. Love you too. <laughs> God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. A reminder that if uh, pastoral care would be helpful to you right now, don't hesitate to get in touch with the clergy. That's what we're here for.
You can do that by email and phone. Uh, we want to be there to, to listen to you, to pray with you, and to support you on this journey. God bless you, everyone. Have a great day. Amen, amen, amen. Bye-bye. Love, love you, Kathy. Love you, Kathy. Bye. Love you, too. Love you, you Kathy. Bye. Oh, my love you, too. Bye. Bye. Love you. Bye. Nobody, nobody <laughs> wants to hang up. No, no. I know, right? Hey, <laughs> we need to know how to handle it. Claire Bear. More time. You might have to force it, Claire Bear. I oh, know, <laughs> right? I'm going to end this. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Bye. 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 Back. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Be safe. You too. We're Yay! going for it. Hi, y'all. Go, Claire, go. Shut us down. <laughs>